All right, we're live. Welcome to A Growing Concern. And growing is the uh, word for tonight because we're going to talk a little bit about the, the local issues uh, around medical marijuana, the fact that uh, the laws have been passed that allowed folks to uh, get help that isn't addicting and a lot of the side effects and problems with, uh, with uh, opiate drugs and the, some of the other drugs that are out there. And now there's been a recent crackdown. And we're, we're here in the studio with Steve Geiger, a good friend of mine, who's going to tell us a little bit about his experiences. Steve, you're the executive director of, uh, what was the name of your? The Foster Healing Center. The Foster Healing Center. And uh, you, uh, the, the Foster Healing Center is next door to another business that you started, right? Which is Highway 420, which is a pipe shop and all of those types of things connected with medical marijuana. Right, and uh, that'd be probably a good way to, to, to go into this. Uh, just kind of do a little bit of an odyssey of how you got involved in this. You started out just doing the pipe shop as a, as a, as a business. Right. Originally, we opened the pipe shop. I had uh, tired of the corporate world and decided to try to open my own business. And uh, cannabis was something I knew and understood and uh, thought that was a good place to start. And after I opened the business, uh, you know, and got more active in the cannabis community, I realized quickly that uh, there was a big need for a place for people to gather after being involved with Oregon Normal and going to their meetings and seeing the huge turnouts and meeting people every day in my store, uh, I realized that there was a need. And so I had a small area in the back of my store that I opened originally, and it was actually the first club in the state. Didn't get a lot of credit for it at the time, but... Uh, wasn't big uh, enough, huh? Well, yeah, it, was, it <laughs> was, and it wasn't on the scale of what the Cannabis Cafe was or what they offered, and they were the, you know, the people at Normal were the true pioneers um, in getting those types of things started. But uh, we did open our, our little club in the back and it grew real quickly and we realized again this just was not gonna cut it the small little break area I had in the back of my shop and when the opportunity became available to get the space next door we did and ironically enough it was the address was 6420 6420 which mm -hmm. was kinda nice it seemed like fate and uh, anyway last year we opened up the following the defeat of measure 74 um, we we decided that we didn't need Measure 74 in order to be able to provide access for medicine to patients. We thought within the current OMMP program, if we did things the correct way, we could legally provide access. And oh, that was providing access. People just didn't buy and leave with it right. like they do in California. No, there was no buying or selling. And while some people thought it was semantics, it really wasn't. I mean, it was a donation-based system that was also based in reimbursement. You know, when a grower grows, there's a lot of cost and there's a lot of time and security and money that goes into being able to produce a crop. And there aren't going to be growers that are willing to grow for patients unless they have some incentive and if unless their costs can be covered. And one of the ways we were able to work within the current OMMP program and stay legal was to utilize that reimbursement cost donation format within a private club, which is what we were. And uh, I was on OPB radio this morning speaking with U.S. Attorney William uh, Holden, who uh, was responsible for sending out these letters that uh, um, caused a lot of the clubs to shut down here recently. And so that, uh, that, 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 uh, that just happened recently where all of the folks that had clubs, you weren't the only one in town. In fact, there was something on, I think, one of the channels a while back that there's a number of them that popped up. Right. Yeah, and they all received these letters from this holder. This is the attorney general, federal attorney general holder? Yeah, he's the Oregon state attorney general, but he's on the federal level. And uh, he's, yeah, he, he decided uh, whether it's for his own political career or exactly what his political motivations are, I'm not sure. But they did something similar to what they did in Colorado and in California when the medical marijuana program began to expand and dispensaries began to pop up. Um, they attacked the landlords, and that's what they did here in Oregon. They sent letters uh, to all of our all of the landlords of the places they could identify that were the private clubs they thought were operating illegally, and um, this, of course, 
you know, if you're a landlord and you get a letter that says your property is going to be seized because of what your tenant is doing. That's the end of the story. Pretty much <laughs> yeah. most landlords are not going to accept that type of risk. Unless both the landlord and the person doing the work is the same person. Right. And, and actually our landlord was very supportive of what we were trying to do and um, was disappointed that he had no choice in the advice of his attorney um, not to put his property at risk even though he didn't think it was a real risk he just didn't have the ability to take that type of risk to, mm -hmm. to, because the feds could use him as an example and he was supportive of us but like I said was unwilling to take that risk so we were evicted and had to shut down so this this uh, attorney general that was going after you was he going after you under Oregon law or under federal law well he claims both Okay, he, he, you know, when, when questioned and cornered almost every interview that I've heard him in, he quickly reverts back to, well, the bottom line is it's illegal under federal law. And so he, you know, there's, there are those who feel that we can't do what we were doing legally, even under state law. And there is some debate there because the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program language is so ambiguous and so broad. I've heard that, yeah. And so many aspects of it that it's very difficult to say this is is or is not okay or acceptable but uh, after talking with some of the leading cannabis attorneys in the state was when I determined that we could be legal under state law and that's what we proceeded under was the thought that our cannabis private club with a donation reimbursement system was legal under state law. Are there any of the clubs that are uh, remaining in business? Uh, there are. There are some who own their own property, um, and there are some whose either landlords haven't found out or are, are not succumbing to the threats. Um, it seems to be volatile and uh, popping up and down all the time. Um, you know, I can't really comment on the quality of the clubs that are out there or if they're doing it the right way. And by the right way, to me, I mean, we had the support. I'm just going to ask that. <laughs> we had the support of our neighborhood associations, Jim. We had, I, I'm on, on the border of two neighborhood associations. We had the support of our neighborhood associations. We had the support of the Portland police, who even quoted that our organization was a reputable one in the Willamette Week. Um, we have our own district attorney here in Portland who said he would refuse to prosecute uh, clubs like ours in, in, our, in our county. So locally, we are doing just fine. In our neighborhood, we're a plus. We're helping people. It was only on the federal level for this political endeavor that uh, we began to you know, have to have these sort of problems. Mm -hmm. Well, since you had the local uh, authorities pretty much on your side, how would this district attorney uh, take this business? Would he go through federal court and completely bypass local? Which, which would mean it wasn't. Oregon yeah. law. From what I understand, the federal government has a lot of ability to put pressure on the states and the justice departments within those states to do what they want. And when they don't, they can still follow up with federal charges. And if you're in uh, trying to help people in the way that we were, you don't want to face federal charges with mandatory minimums. And, and so the, they wield a very big hammer of threat. Um, regardless, even if the state is unwilling to cooperate with prosecution. Mm -hmm. And even if the president says to lay off, apparently. Exactly. Isn't that one of the few things that he did, he well, said he was going to do? One of a long trail of broken promises by our current president. Mm -hmm. So is he is he come out and rescinded that? Because I know earlier he said that he wasn't going to, he put the order out not to be, uh, you know, prosecuting. Right. So is this under his order that this is being done? You well, know? I think you're getting mixed messages. You got something coming out of Washington saying one thing, and then you've got people like, you know, here in our trying state. Trying to make their bones. Uh, uh, trying to make their political career or, you know, exactly what their motivations are. I'm not real sure. But I do know that this issue is much more important than um, stoners getting high. And the people out there that are watching that don't smoke marijuana, that think this issue is about stoners getting high, high, I really challenge them to um, look into a little bit further. And if, for example, somebody came to one of our, to our club and sat there for a week and watched the people that came, watched what they did and who they were, I think pretty quickly they'd realize that most of these people were elderly, were sick, are people that, um, whose lives were miserable on opiates and who have replaced those opiates with cannabis. And uh, I mean, I had Jim, I had 
had people come in on a daily basis crying and hugging me and our other uh, collective members thanking us for changing their lives and giving them access to something that uh, has made a huge difference in every aspect of their lives. And that's why I think this issue is more important than it may appear on the surface because it really is about personal liberty. It really is about our right to our own medical care and our choice of how we deliver that medical care. And when you're in a very, when you've got chronic pain and you have very, very deep pain, your only goal is to stop that pain. And if your only option is these opiates, that's what you're going to take. No matter what the uh, side effects. No matter what the side effects. And when people are, one of the great things about the show that I was on this morning is a lady called and said, well, you know, I, I'm on these opiates. I want to get off of them. I'd like to try marijuana, but I'm afraid. And I'm afraid because I don't want to get arrested. And, um, you know, I think that's a pretty common thing. And there's a lot of people out there that could be helped. But this peop the, w what's happening here in Oregon right now is a perfect example of the feds ignoring the will of the people in favor of corporate interest. Well, that's a large subject right there. But basically, you know, the whole idea of marijuana being made illegal was corporate interest. The paper industry, you know, the newspaper industry, uh, Hearst, and, uh, and the pharmaceutical industries, you know, that, whole, that whole campaign was uh, to uh, uh, marginalize marijuana. And, and uh, I know there was a lot of racism involved in it with Mexicans. That whole thing was uh, was a bottom line issue it wasn't it wasn't a drug issue or a safety issue at all yeah cannabis was always cannabis until they tried to employ the racist and called it marijuana and and that was to give it a different flavor and to, to mm -hmm. put that onus on it but yeah and as you mentioned it's it's you know this this marijuana cannabis or whatever it uh, it helps people but it's been helping people for 5,000 years yes you know, it isn't like this just all of a sudden, you know, some, some uh, jazz singers and musicians and, and uh, people from Mexico invaded our country and, and, start, and got all the youth hooked on this stuff. I mean, this, this is a, a medicinal plant that has been used. And, you know, the viewers out there have watched anything of the Cannabis Common Sense show that, that comes on after mine at 8 o'clock, which incidentally won't be on live tonight. Uh, they're out of town or something, but... but uh, and another thing I wanted to get back to is what you were saying, you know, if anybody comes in there for a week and watches everybody and sees the good that this does, that's not the impression this fella gave on the, on the program this morning. No, no. He, I, he tried to come on like, uh, you know, he accentuated the abuse and there's abuse with everything. Exactly. And I think that's exactly the point. If we looked at the abuse in the pharmaceutical industry, it is so vast and the uh, the trail of tears caused by the abuse of big pharmaceutical is much more vast than anything that's ever happened with cannabis. Nobody's ever died from cannabis, and big pharma people die by the hundreds every day. And so to even compare the two is is truly somebody that doesn't seem to get it. Uh, this morning uh, he talked a lot about um, the whole fact that you can't, you can't have something illegal on the federal level and claim that it's okay on the state level, but he constantly uh, attacked what was happening on the state level. So if you got a chance to listen to that interview or in the archives, you can hear him speak out of both sides of his mouth. Oh, that's, a, oh, that's the OPB, Thinking Out Loud. That's, that's right, it. Right, and there's a button you can go to and then another button to play it or download it as I was doing it this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, I grabbed a couple of statistics and you know I don't know where they grabbed these statistics out of, but it isn't like I researched it. I just grabbed grabbed a couple. 9.3% of 12th graders reported using Vicodin. And I imagine they might have got some from the black market, but they're getting it from their folks. Right. And 5% are using Oxycontin. And then I had to leave. Uh, 48 million people, I think, more 40, 48 million, uh, it was either children or adults, abused these drugs. And uh, the problem with prescription drugs is commensurate to the money that's being made and then and it would seem to me that the pharmaceutical companies are making an incredible amount of money in fact they're making so much money they're making up diseases like restless leg syndrome and coming up with all these 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 uh uh three letter four letter names of these diseases and all that and and uh, getting people uh, in, to, involved in all these things when i don't know that you know you'd have to be not speaking generally, but there's a lot of things that marijuana helps for. And, and uh, 
people aren't getting wealthy. You know, there, there's no bottom line of billions of dollars being made for this. And the fact that they're going after local people, I, I just don't understand that. Uh, you weren't there in the studio with them, were you? No, I wasn't. You were just on the phone. I wish I could have, but, but no. So they didn't give you much time to, to, it wasn't like a rebuttal back and forth or anything. No, no, it was really short, and we had to make some quick points, and it was quick, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to discuss it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you, you've heard him speak before, and he always, he always uh, demonizes marijuana. He does. His whole tact is that the program is a sham, that it's full of stoners and drug dealers, and that um, the few people that are actually sick, which the program was intended for, are dwarfed by the number of people um, who use the program as a way to get high. He doesn't have any statistics. He doesn't have any evidence to back this up. And when confronted with evidence that disputes that claim, he sort of writes it off and ignores it. And, you know, the truth is, is that the medical marijuana program in Oregon, as in other states, has abuses. And there are always going to be people that will use any end they can to attempt to abuse a system. Our, our medical uh, system has many abuses. Big pharma and pharmaceutical has had many abuses. Alcohol has abuses. But to claim that because the system is abused that we throw the baby out with the bathwater is reactionary, short-sighted, and uh, obviously um, just incomplete viewpoint. Mm-hmm. I've seen some, I think it was CNN reports or something about uh, medical marijuana or about the, the growth of medical marijuana. And uh, it was in California mainly, I think probably the Emerald Triangle down there, mm -hmm. you know, in, in uh, th those counties around Eureka. And uh, they just, people making a lot of money down there. Is it possible that he's speaking about a national tendency? And, and since he's in touch with Oregon, in mm -hmm. charge of Oregon, he's just throwing all that into Oregon's basket? Well, I think that the subject needs to be separated from the illegal grows and the, the big money people that are moving large amounts of cannabis and the issue of medical marijuana and access for medical marijuana patients. Um, there are some that want to entangle those two and cr make them into one. And again, because there are some abuses and some criminals in any element of anything does not therefore damn the entire program. And, and that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to use, in fact, they used a case this morning of out in Aloha. There was a particular club that opened that named itself Wake and Bake. With a name like Wake and Bake, You're you immediately <laughs> have identified yeah. yourself not mm -hmm. as a medical facility, but as exactly what the critics have um, have ammo for. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, the one that he brought up this morning to illustrate that these clubs are not what they claim to be. And at any rate, that's the type of thing we've had to deal with at the clubs where we're trying to do things the right way, which is to have our goal at the Foster Healing Center was to be able to provide access to patients at a price that would be lower than what the street level was through the donation reimbursement pro process. But with a storefront and insurance and employees, the overhead to be able to try to do what we were doing is huge. So the money that was coming in was all going back into the operation of the nonprofit and the payment of the employees. And nobody was getting rich, certainly not me. And uh, that's not why we went into this and why we did what we did. And I think that's true of a lot of these clubs and while that might not be true of many of them it I think most of the people that are doing what we're doing do believe in the program do believe in helping people and are trying to um, further enhance the medical marijuana program in Oregon and and give people access to medicine that they can't get otherwise mm hmm it always occurred to me that uh, it just seems kind of odd that uh, uh, if a person wants to smoke marijuana, why do they have to go through the medical? It's, it's out on the street, you know, and in fact, right. medical marijuana uh, has driven the price down because there's less of a call for that, mm -hmm. it seems like to me. And, and, you know, why would somebody want to go through, put a couple of 300 bucks down for, for the, for the uh, permits that you need to do, mm -hmm. and then Uncle Sam's got your name, mm -hmm. you know, and all that. It would seem to me that a lot of the people that want to abuse it uh, aren't going to want to go through this system anyway. 
Yeah, and there is a lot of fear, and rightfully so, in putting your name out there on any list in, in any way. But I, I think it's sort of unfounded in that the truth is, is even the feds are not interested in patients. They're interested in the people who are, are propagating and, and are, are actually making cannabis a viable option for people in the country. Mm -hmm. The more viable it becomes and the more readily accessible it becomes, the less big pharma can profit off those who have no other option and mm -hmm. that's why we're where we're at you know or at least that's one of the biggest reasons and um you know where we go from here it's tough to say i i'm hoping that in january the legislature is you know is beginning to change and there's more and more people that are beginning to consider some type of enhancement or change that would bring revenue to the state and also provide more access to medical marijuana patients and so we're hopeful that we can open back up again um, when things change, and uh, that's what our plan is. And if I have the opportunity, I'm going to open up again with or without a landlord. Um, uh, we didn't get into this to close down as soon as we were threatened. That wasn't why we did it. Uh, we we would have stayed there until the feds came and dragged us out of there. We, we had no intention aside of quitting. Aside from the landlord issue. Aside from yeah. the landlord issue, yeah. and we had no choice there. That we had to do what we had to do. But we do plan on opening back up, and uh, I'm hopeful that by uh, the January legislature that uh, we might see some enhancements that uh, take away some of the clouds around some of these things. So what kind of enhancements can the Oregon legislature do that would uh, alleviate the pressure from the feds well, and that you would support? Well, something similar to what Colorado and California have done and other states that have dispensary sort of setups is that to create some program within the OMMP that's governed by the state and the Department of Human Services that allows access to medicine beyond growing it yourself or finding a grower. And right now, that's the only options a patient has. And if you have no grower and you're not a social person or you're an elderly person that doesn't know people, to go out and find yeah. a grower is almost impossible. And there's so many predators out there preying on people who aren't familiar with the situation. It's another real problem. Um, growers that you know claim to make promises for patients and then don't follow through. And that is an issue. Yes. And, there's, there's, and so you know, we've got huge holes in the program. There. I mean, we created this program. Program. The voters voted it in. We have all of these people that have this need, and they just said, well, too bad. Access, good luck. Find it. You know, mm -hmm. do what you need to do, and and it's just silly. And anybody that takes a look at it understands that you can't have a program that doesn't w work. And if it doesn't work, you have to make it work. And right now, it doesn't work, and that's why we're going through this type of stuff that we're going through. And uh, I'm mm -hmm. just hopeful that more and more people will call their legislatures and let them know that this, what's happening with the medical marijuana program here is unacceptable and that people need access to the medicine and that our program has got huge holes in it and it needs to be fixed. And it's an obvious uh, another revenue gain for the state. Uh, it's, it's a huge uh, cash crop that could, could uh, help our schools and our roads mm -hmm. and our bridges and um, not to mention hemp. I mean, you know, a whole other side of things. But the, the reason hemp is still illegal in this country is because of cannabis and that, the two being confused. But Hemp meaning the plant that's grown close together and stringing, they use it for rope and all the other another, textiles. Another species of cannabis, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's for textiles and rope and paper and every kind of a mat, food and fiber mm -hmm. and everything you can think of. Yeah. Sure. You know, you mentioned the enhancements and uh, the enhancements you, you mentioned seem to me the same thing that the voters just turned down recently. Or am I, or no, you're right. But as you're well aware, our initiative process has been watered down to the point to make it very difficult for the voters to be able to, unless you have a lot of money, it is very difficult for the common voter in Oregon to be able to discern what the truth is through initiative advertising. And at a grassroots level, to be able to get the type of signatures necessary to get a measure like that on the ballot, takes every bit of money that anybody could raise to begin with just to get on the ballot. Just to get on the ballot and so yeah. it's very easy for the opposition or the critics to shout it down because there's no more money to correct right. that. They, they and, didn't have that expenditure. And there was a lot of scare tactics around dispensaries. And, and also the truth is, is there's a lot of people who consider themselves marijuana advocates who are against 
dispensaries because that's their cash cow. That's their bottom line. And, and that's and it's the same problem in California. There's, uh, you know, we don't have a united cannabis community, and it's because people have their mm -hmm. own interests. On the left, we don't have united any kind of community. This is true. <laughs> so that's the part circular of it. firing squad <laughs> yeah. is just as well alive on mm -hmm. uh, in the cannabis community as it is on right. the left. Well, it's yeah. starting to show itself in the right community too now, the conservative community, I should say, yeah. as well. They're yeah. starting to have some holes in in their uh, their united front. Well, you know, you've already kind of covered what you what would want to see, and. Uh, you were talking about maybe out of the legislature something coming up, but isn't there some, you know, isn't Paul Stanford and them folks trying to get something forward? Is that, is that, uh, that initiative along the lines of what you're talking about? Was well, they're moving Anka forward or something with, like with that? another tax and regulate initiative as they have every year for you know, 10 Forever. or 11. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I support that. I support the legalization of cannabis. I, I mean, I think even stoners should be able to get high if they want to. I certainly don't oppose it. But right now, we're talking about the medical marijuana program, and that is what we have. And I think when people confuse it is when we give ammo to people like our particular U.S. Attorney General. Mm -hmm. Give him more power than he should have. Right. Well, uh, that, uh, what is it, the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act? Right. Octa, and they're right. out connecting signat collecting signatures right now? Right. Is that what's going right. on? In fact, they just recently had a uh, fundraiser that didn't have to raise any funds. But uh, as you say, that costs a lot of money to, uh, to collect the signatures and all. Uh, they pretty much can't do that anymore without paid signatures. Because mm -hmm. I can remember in 72 when I first moved up here, people weren't you know, getting paid for it hardly, right. and then that, that's all changed. Are you in support of that particular one? Well, I mean, I think each one has to be looked at on its own merits, and it's complex. It's it's not as simple as, yes, I'm for legalizing pot. Each one of these initiatives and measures has its own language and its own points that, you know, I mean, overall, I'm for legalization of marijuana, mm -hmm. uh, totally. But you know, the tax and regulate part is when you begin to to invite <laughs> problems and wonder if we're ever going to have cannabis the way that it used to be, you know, so it's scary, but at the same time, I think we need to move forward and deal with the problems as we hit them. Hit them. Yeah. No, you, you, you seem pretty knowledgeable about all this. Wasn't there a city in California or somewhere that recently uh, made it legal and, and uh, we're going to get revenue from it? Um, yeah, I think there's been a couple of them. I know Oakland was, you know, going to do, yeah. do their big grow and had, you know, several things going on that was on the forefront of change, and some of that's been turned back since then. But, yeah, I haven't – I've been sort of busy lately, so I've been right. able to keep up on everything. I was but, just wondering uh, uh, if, if the feds came down on them. That would be the way to do it and not just to have the citizens challenge it with initiatives or whatever, but uh, to have cities go – and uh, to try to get some uh, revenue out of it. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it would just seem to me that, that uh, not all of these have been citizens' initiative across, what was it, up to 14, 16, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that? Some of them state legislatures have right. brought in. Right, right. And that, that would seem to be a completely different dynamic. Well, I think one of the things that's changed is the need for revenue has grown so great since the country is in such a hole sure. that uh, you know the need for money makes strange, strange bedfellows. Well, they're willing to turn people into into uh, gambling addicts. Right. Right. Know, right. So, so we're beginning to see the tide against marijuana begin to change a little bit, partly in because of the need for revenue, but also partly because even Big Pharma admits it's medicine. Everybody understands it's medicine. AMA the, did finally. Cancer mm -hmm. is at like a, you know, such a rate that everybody's got a friend or a relative that's on it and has probably used cannabis at some point and everybody is beginning to see this works. This gave, this gave my mother six more months of life because she was able to eat. I mean, there are thousands of people that are having those experiences every year that didn't used to have them and that in addition to just the revenue needs is beginning to I mean I'm seeing a tide building toward real change yeah and the, the fact that uh, it doesn't have side effects I mean the fact that it performs these medicinal uses is one thing yes. but the side effects of, of these opiates you know I've talked to people that like like you said you know have, have were involved in this and uh, people were in tears Yes, because the, the side effects of uh, of uh, and of the opiates and uh, you know I don't really what are some of the side effects? 
Well, you mean other the opiates? Than, yeah, the opiates, other than addiction. Yeah, you know, I think it's just a general lethargy and a general not a, a malaise and an un inability to have joy. And um, from what I've just been described to on a daily basis with people that came right. in, I mean, that's the general consensus I'm getting is that I couldn't do anything. I didn't want to do anything. I felt awful. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to, you know, these opiates just drug me down and put me down there where I just wasn't enjoying life. And now that I've got off of those and started having the cannabis, everything's interesting and I've got a smile on my face and things are good and my pain is being managed. Mm -hmm. And this is over and over and over and over again that we saw this just at our place alone. So I know it's happening, it's happening. everywhere. It's happening everywhere. And, uh, and, and uh, I know that it's, it's uh, can't remember all 14 states, but I know Colorado, California, uh, some states you wouldn't expect, Montana, like Montana. Jersey, but some of them are moving, moving uh, to uh, put an end to it, to yes. curtail it. Yes, and uh, we don't see that happening in this state. I don't see it happening in this state, but you know, remember it was. Uh, you're old enough to remember, Jim. Back Thanks. In, <laughs> back in the '70s, we were real close to cannabis being legalized, and everybody thought it was. It, it was, was a no-brainer, right? Yeah. And it was nobody really opposed it. And then Ronald Reagan came along, and that war on drugs hit. And mm -hmm. 30 years later, we're still trying to scratch to get back to where we were. And I see on the horizon the possibility of something similar to that. And we've just seen it here in Oregon with a complete reversal of what they said they were going to do with the mm -hmm. U.S. Attorney General doing what he's done. And so there seems to be this hard right sort of flow coming in through the uh, Justice Departments around this cannabis issue all of a sudden. So we could very well find ourselves, when we thought we were on the brink of change and progress, being mm -hmm. reverted right back to where we were. Well, the thing is, you know, like we've, we've mentioned, and it, 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 it's worth mentioning again that uh, marijuana is flying in the face of uh, multi-billion dollar <sighs> operations that uh, I can't really see how it could do that much damage to their bottom line, but uh, it could, I suppose. Well, if you think about watching TV and all those commercials, like you said, of every single ailment you can possibly think of that they show you on these commercials that you take this for, almost all of those cannabis will work better than, and you can grow it in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. That's a real threat. That's true. <laughs> I guess there's more of a threat there than I, than I thought. Yes. And also, you know, once the medical marijuana gets the door opened, as you mentioned, there's hemp. And, yes. uh, you know, I'm sure they talk about it on Paul's, Paul's program, you know, the, uh, the clothes, the textiles, the rope, the, uh, all the different things that it can be used for. I mean, the seed has an incredible amount of oil in it that can yes. be turned into diesel. And, uh, it's by far the most productive uh, um, for biodiesel of all of the different fibers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there, there's, there's so many things that uh, when they shut this down, was it Anslinger, I guess, in the 1920s? It was, I don't know, he was the drug czar back then, but he had some kind of position in the government where he got this um, reefer madness and all these scare tactics and, and got marijuana uh, made against the law. And then I guess the law originally was, I mean, you could not have it without declaring it to pay a tax. And it was Timothy Leary that challenged that finally mm -hmm. in the 60s. And they said, well, that's double jeopardy or whatever, and you can't do that. But it, it didn't really help. It's still illegal. And it's, it's, it's still a what, class three or four drug. Do you, know, you understand how that classification works? Well, it's, it's a Schedule I schedule drug, one, which is would. as high as it can be. It's on the right. same category as heroin or cocaine or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously absurd. There has been talks of dropping that down, but and I and they did on or at the state level, like so many things ah. on the state level. You know, they did change it, but on the federal level, it's still a Schedule mm -hmm. One. So you're going to be uh, kind of dog paddling for a while until some changes are made, but you don't. You're not going to take no for an answer. I take it. Oh no, we're uh -huh. we're going to continue our fight, and that's why we got into this and why we started it, and especially once we saw how many people we helped and what the need was, we know we're driven to continue, and we're not going to be frightened or scared away, and mm -hmm. we're willing to face whatever they want to throw our way um, in an effort to try to fight against this 
obscene and insidious and ridiculous prohibition. Well, you know, things tend to go back and forth, and you know, like you said, the '70s things were good. Then it was recriminalized, and you know, it, it nothing stays the same, and you know, and it, it's probably going to always go back and forth. The the parameters between which it goes back and forth might change, right. and hopefully they're going to get probably a little bit more benevolent as time goes on. Uh, what's it, what's it going to take, do you think, to turn it around? Uh, just education? You know, I think like so many things that you and I have both been involved with for so long is uh, to get people off the couch and to get people active. And uh, mm. if we just got just a small percentage of all the people that have either smoked marijuana or have had a relative helped by it who is sick uh, get active, the, the numbers would be so huge they would be overwhelming. But most people who enjoy the right and the ability to access cannabis do not follow through with any sort of activism or even as much as a phone call or a letter or uh, attending a rally. And um, those are types of things that some people think are meaningless. But I think on an issue like this that's on the fence and is beginning to change, the numbers of people showing up and getting involved does matter. Well, you know, you could say the same thing for uh, the people that are losing their jobs to going overseas, the fair trade right. rules, the laws that are going on. Uh, a lot of these different things you think people would, would, uh, would want to get up off that couch, you know, which sounds kind of strange because if people think about people smoking marijuana, they're, they're, they're couch potatoes and <laughs> shoving ho-hos in their face. But that's not really what, what that, that is a, a perception that's it's really, not, it's really not true. I've had a few ho hos, Jim. Oh yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, but it, that apathy is is uh, not necessarily for marijuana. Though. No, no, and in fact, I think it it happens with people a lot. Uh, just the opposite, you know, to where it activates and and vigorates and uh, challenges them to get involved, and they get creative and they get motivated, and you know, this idea of the slacker watching TV may be one aspect of one type of person, but uh, Cannabis is much more complex than any mm. stereotype that you could put on any one person. I, I picture more a can of beer in someone's hand than yeah. a bong. There you, you know? go. <laughs> and, and, and the alcohol is, you know, you, how many people are killed in uh, alcohol-related uh, accidents, whether it's, you know, automobiles or guns or whatever, compared to, you know, like you say, I don't think they've ever, ever documented anybody dying from marijuana, whether it's overdose. Right. Or, or uh, you know, there might have been someone that was blown out on marijuana that drove a car, but they might have been probably drinking, too. Right. And so there's really no documentation on that. Certainly not enough to challenge what has been going on with alcohol all these years. Well, and really, it shouldn't be called a drug, because in order to be classified as a drug, you have to have a toxicity level of death. Cannabis has never killed anybody. It mm -hmm. doesn't have a toxicity of level of death. You could eat a pound of it and you're not going to die. You might get real sick, but you're not going to die. <laughs> right. And so it's not a drug. It is an herb, and it's been a medicine for thousands of years. And to argue it any other way as what's being done in this country and many others is as absurd as it is ridiculous. Sure. And I, I remember hearing on the radio a while back that... Uh, uh, some radio station had some kind of challenge, and some girl got onto it and drank so much water she died. Mm. So you know, just about anything can kill you. If you, you know, so that 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 issue just seems kind of strange to me. But I see, like we're like almost 20. We are 20 minutes till, so we got some time to open up the phones. Didn't mean to let it go this long, but it's been a, a very interesting conversation. Folks want to call up, and in lieu of the fact that Cannabis Common Sense isn't going to be there tonight, uh, maybe we can answer some questions, or you know, we'll open to your comments. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to medical marijuana. You know, the fact that uh, so many, so many people think it's evil is something that needs to be turned around, and uh, that is what has been happening since what 1920s. That that media push. And, and, you know, and since Hearst was one of the ones that wanted to keep paper industry rich, the media has always really been on the, on the downside of this. They haven't really, uh, I don't, nothing I have seen has really been that objective. 
I'm working on a film project right now where we're trying to put a collage together of medical marijuana patients who mostly older people who you would look at and wouldn't think would be your average marijuana user to sort of describe why they use it, how they started using it. And anyway, the point of this whole video would be if you were somebody that was apprehensive about trying it or using it for your own health issues and you saw other people that you saw that were like you that were explaining how they did it and why uh, it might make you feel comfortable enough to be able to open the door to uh, trying that alternative medicine. So you're out actively interviewing people and collect, we're, we're collecting? We're beginning to do that now, yeah. All right. Who's we you involved with? Um, well, you know Kat and um, oh, yeah. some of those people are, are we're working together on that. And uh, so hopefully that'll be something we can put together here soon. Long range project? Yeah, well, it's, not, it's short it's range, but it's it's not happening yet. Is it going to be by January? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, this is going to be real soon. Yeah. Is this just going to be local Oregon people, or are you going to be... Yeah, I believe so, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, they're working on a larger project, and this is going to be a small part of it, but uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be my contribution or my part of it. Because I know, like we mentioned, Montana, but Washington also. And every state's different. Mm -hmm. And very few of the states will recognize the marijuana medical marijuana card from another state, even if it's a bordering state. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is there any move to make any of that those changes, do you know? I'm sorry. Any move to make those changes that were were uh, a, a medical marijuana card in this state would be recognized from another state would be recognized in this state because that that seems you know you're you're taking your chances. Yeah, the interprocity between states has always been a big issue, especially on border states like Washington and Oregon, where you know your card going across the bridge doesn't matter, and over here it does. It's it seems sort of pointless, but. The truth is there are such vast difference bet bet between some states like California, for example, which I think has 50 or 60 qualifying conditions as opposed to Oregon, which has five. Mm -hmm. And so just because you have a card in California doesn't mean you would necessarily have a right to one in Oregon. Oh, because of the qualifying conditions? Right. I right. never thought about that. That's a good point. Yeah. But that being said, the truth is it's a medical marijuana state, and if you have medicine on you, you should be protected in other states that have medical marijuana laws and that that simple part should be true in my opinion and that's something that's another enhancement to the OMMP that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. so when you say enhancement that means that the uh, just like any other legislation there would have to be a legislator who would put this bill forward and try to get other people to stay uh, to uh, sign on to it is there anybody that's making noise that they're gonna they would want to do that down there in Salem you know, that's Chip a good... Chip Shields or any, any yeah, more progressive I mean, people? you know, of course, Floyd brzezanski has been a leader in that area for a long time, and there's more and more people who are beginning to sign on to the idea of possible new revenue. revenue as yeah. a, and, and, Get um, the fiscal conservatives in there. Right, right. And so, and I think that they understand that this money is going to be made with or without them, and they better get a piece of it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I know that they're all pretty conservative around here. Even even the ones that uh, like from my district out there, uh, Cannon. He seems pretty pretty progressive. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I don't. It seems to me it would take a a, a lot of of uh, well not energy but uh, bravery to to step up and bring that forward. If you were to do it under the guise of of, uh, of uh, revenue, I think it would give you a little bit of cover. Yes, but I don't know if it would all work that way. But we've got the number up there. If folks are interested in calling up, if not, you know, we probably you feel like we've covered this pretty good. Well, I think we put a big dent in we it. We put yeah. a big dent in it. Yeah. And you're going to continue doing this, and uh, you know, you're going to might be end up losing the place next door to where you are now, probably because they're right. going to probably move to rent. Yeah, that. we're going to give up one of the spaces, and we're going to move forward with our store. But as I said, we're going to continue our fight, and we're planning on reopening. It's just a matter of where and when. And mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, we're not going to let them stop us. So are you getting together with some of the other ones that have been run out of business and, and forming your own little group? there or no we haven't done that yet we've been sort of busy trying to scramble to deal with everything <laughs> that goes with what's happened but uh, mm -hmm. yeah we're interested in talking with more people in the cannabis community and trying to create a little more unity and seeing if we can't work together more than what's been done in the past with some of the old sure. guard. have you have you uh, instigated a website or any any contact information where people want to join to, no, to reinstate the the, the uh, the Florence Nightingale effect of, of, <laughs> of, of the medical marijuana? 
No, I haven't, but I, I am involved in some blogs where, you know, those things are discussed. And But that that might not be a bad idea. Maybe we could create a website where we could begin to uh, see if we can heal some of these old wounds and bring people together. Right, because that's, that's what needs to be done, because there's a lot of folks. I mean, you know, we don't, we're not getting any phone calls tonight, and sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But the phone's always ringing off the hook next door for the mm. Cannabis Common Sense over there. Right. They're, 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 it's a very... Very uh, popular issue, and you know, some people are going to call up and talk about marijuana because you know it's it's anti-authoritarian, and you know, it's it's something that's that you're not supposed to do. Oh, we we do have a phone call. All right, we'll get the first caller on the air. First caller. Hello. Hello, you're on the uh, air. Hello. Uh, my point would be uh, by not letting the dispensaries operate, because if a patient really is in need which I am a patient, um, if a patient's really in need, they're going to get the medication wherever they may be able to get it. And by not letting dispensaries operate, they're actually putting money where they say they don't want the money to go, which is the cartels in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you say and, that you are a medical marijuana you know, hold, it, card holder. It, you know, we say, we, you know, we hear about this fast and furious, and, uh, you know, you have to wonder whether the government really is playing two sides of the fence here. Well, what, what do you mean by playing two sides of the fence? Well, you know, you say they say they don't want, you know, they say they're doing the war against the cartel, and yet they're really helping the cartel with these weapons, and then they're allowing, you know, they're, they're shutting down these dispensaries, and then... You know, and yet they already have an idea that if a patient's really in need, they're going to get it wherever they can get it. That's true. And uh, that's the way they used to do it before the, the laws came in. So I'm not asking what your medical condition is, but what prompted you to go ahead and get your medical card? Um, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be legal in the first place, you know, because there is always that risk of, uh, you know, if you're not legal, then you could, you know, get arrested and that. So I wanted to be, you know, pretty much out in the open in the first place, although I do support, you know, if you're going to have alcohol legal, I think that uh, cannabis should be a uh, very legal thing as well with certain restrictions, you know, mind you. But I think legalization is a very, uh, you know, it should be at least discussed. That's a good point, and, 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 and there should be a discussion and a conversation with, with people from all walks of life around that issue. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any response? I mean, I guess I should ask him what he meant by cartels. I, I expected he probably meant the, the drug cartels, mostly in Mexico, but those cartels are up here uh, with, with methamphetamines and are also up here growing incredibly large marijuana crops, too. If I'm not mistaken, I think his point was that by opening up a dispensary system, you're getting a lot of local growers participating rather than cartels moving in to supply the needs of patients in the black market. Oh, okay. You have more of a local sort of more the way the system was supposed to operate uh, method of access versus, you know, having uh, all these big cartels moving large uh, mm -hmm. sums of marijuana. Right. So, it, it, you know, that, that is a good point that uh, the medical marijuana, you know, maybe folks out there, you know, they, they don't watch the Cannabis Common Sense show. What exactly did that initiative uh, do when it, when it was passed many, many years ago? The, 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 the medical marijuana, the original one, right. Well, the original one, there's been a few changes to it since then, um, but originally it was that if you had these conditions and you could get a doctor to prescribe this to you or recommend, it's actually not a prescription, but recommend marijuana as a alternative, then you could legally possess it and grow it. And since then, there's been changes to how much you can have, how much you can possess, how much you can grow, and uh, how much the fees are, and who can do what and who can't. Those sorts of things have changed, but the crux of the program has always been that uh, you can grow or possess if you have a doctor recommend cannabis for mm -hmm. you. It seems to me that the, the biggest glaring deficiency of the Oregon medical marijuana law that is 
okay in California is the, some of the psychiatric or psychosomatic or whatever problems. Maybe right. psychosomatic is not the right word, but like PTSD. Yes. You know, we're sending people over to another country, and it isn't a war. We can get into this one. It's an occupation, and it seems like, uh, you know, uh, the original... Uh, Back in the Vietnam, it took some of those folks 10, 12 years to hit the streets homeless and have all their issues dealt with. Uh, now people are coming back and they're homeless within, you know, weeks or months. Right. And the, the PTSD is a real issue. And uh, they don't allow that here. Right. And uh, is there any movement to, to uh, change that in, in the legislature? Any movement, you know, like with, with uh, like Veterans for Peace or some of the organizations that, that, are, that are out you know, working for the uh, the uh, returning veterans, is there any move towards that? I don't know if there's an organized move of uh, multiple groups working on that issue, but I do know that marijuana activists here in Oregon made a play to increase the qualifying conditions and the types to include some of the types of your, your things you're talking about in California. And, uh, you know, the truth is there's a lot of people who smoke marijuana on a daily basis who haven't been recommended by a doctor. But if you're smoking or you're, in, you're taking any substance that affects you on a daily basis, then and what you're doing is self-medicating. And if you're self-medicating, you're doing it for a reason. You can call it recreational use, but if you're using the substance every day, you are self-medicating. That's a good and, point. I never thought about and that. And I think before. that people that have depression and stress and uh, every type of thing related with the psychological <laughs> part of being a human being understands that cannabis provides a lot of relief in a lot of different ways and whether you want to call that medicine or not uh, you know to me it's obvious that it is and our qualifying conditions in Oregon need to be expanded to include those types of mm -hmm. things right and you have you know have stress relief on one end and recreation use on the other but you know it's a continuum it's not total opposites that, that they don't necessarily interact so. exactly so exactly. I, I can see what you're saying. That, that was a really good point. It just seems to me that it's, it's, an, it's an important thing, the uh, PTSD, what, what is that, uh, what does that stand for? Partum syndrome, some postpartum syndrome or post-traumatic post stress syndrome. Post-traumatic stress right, syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, abused, uh, uh, people that are under abuse, whether it's children or wives or, you know, soldiers are definitely being abused. They don't, they don't look at it that way, but the mm -hmm. fact they're being sent to another country to, to occupy and enforce, enforce uh, an occupation, that seems to me that, that that's, that's rife for uh, PTSD. And uh, they allow that in California. They have a lot larger uh, bunch of of qualifying conditions down there. I guess. Yes, they do. And I think that was, you know, I mentioned that uh, that the program that I saw, that was one of the ones that they were complaining about was so many things that, uh, you know, you can complain of pain from just about anything and get a, get a mm -hmm. card down mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's been exaggerated. In fact, Attorney General this morning tried to make the point that, uh, you know, he's six foot five and he rides on the yeah, coach. He rides in coach and he it hurts his back as if that, you know, it's much more difficult to get your card than that. You have to have a history of a, of a medical record in your past of one of the qualifying conditions. And you have to have a doctor that prescribed you a pharmaceutical that you don't want to take. And so it's, it's, it's not as easy as saying my back hurts and I need a card and those people that try to propagate that idea are critics of the program or they are people that just don't understand the truth. That at one time it may have been a little bit easier to get than it is now but you still have to have some evidence and showing in a medical history that you have one of these qualifying conditions. And one of the reasons so many people in Oregon use chronic pain is because of the limited number of qualifying conditions we have. And and if we had the types of qualifying conditions that California had, many more people would be able to put their category in its proper place. But when your only thing that allows you to get your card is chronic pain, that's the only category in which you fit into, that's what people are going to go for. And for the Attorney General to use that statistic as a way to demean or diminish the the quality of the program is just absurd. It's, it's, it's not accurate. The reason people use chronic pain is because of the limited number of qualifying conditions. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear a whole lot of what he had to say, but it just seemed to me that he, he was talking about all the bad things about it, 
did he ever really admit that uh, some people are getting something out of this? Oh, he actually did in a very short, uh, for, for, for a few seconds, uh, he said, yeah, I know there are marijuana activists out there that are helping people and doing this the right way, but they're being overshadowed by those that uh, are not. And, uh, you know, I at that point pointed out to him that uh, he said he didn't he didn't send out letters to the people that were doing it the wrong way. He sent out letters to everybody's landlord and it was reckless and irresponsible and that he didn't even bother to find out anything about the places that he threatened to shut down uh, before he did it. And, mm -hmm. uh, of course, he immediately went back to, well, it's all illegal under federal law. You know, mm -hmm. Which is okay. Which is true, you know, <laughs> and uh, nothing, nothing you can do about that. Right. Uh, are there any other states that are doing this? Doing the, the, the going after the. Uh, yeah, well, Montana had a bunch of raids a couple months ago, and in Seattle that. there were several dispensaries that have been operating for several years without uh, any kind of problem that were shut down. Um, you know, where it happens and why I think is political on some level. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, in tune with everything that's happening in all the states, but there definitely has been a shift in the last several months from where we were when the Obama administration took over to today. And they are definitely going on a mission against medical marijuana mm -hmm. states and uh, patient access. I'm wondering, you know, we got about three minutes left here. I'm wondering, is it really because of the abuse of this or because of people probably on the right, conservatives wanting to use that modicum of abuse as leverage. You know, I, I, I'm sure there is abuse. There's abuse with everything. Yes, there is. But, uh, you know, apparently maybe they, the folks that wanted to use that abuse waited for a while for it to, to become kind of well-known and covered in various places and then use that as kind of like a, a hammer to, to uh, if not pass legislation, at least get the feds involved. Because I'm sure that the uh, the uh, the folks that are doing this up in Seattle and here, they must be in touch with the feds. Oh yeah, yeah, I believe they are. And you know why they do what they do and how? It's I I can't tell you, and uh, I don't really even want to guess anymore. I'm not sure what's going on in Washington that's causing this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what the the real motivations are beyond what we can kind of see with our own eyes, which is the grasp that corporate America has on our, our system from every every branch of government mm -hmm. and uh, if you follow the money that's where it seems to indicate is these people are not following the will of the people but rather the will of their corporate masters masters you know and down to about a minute and a half I guess the, we could just make a quick uh, what do you think about you think this is a state's rights issue yeah, you know, I'm uncomfortable with states' rights on a whole bunch of levels, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. I mean, if uh, the voters of Oregon have decided that this is a legitimate form of medicine, if a doctor prescribes it to a patient, then that's what the p voters of Oregon have decided, and uh, we should have the right to do that. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what the, it needs to be addressed on the federal level obviously, because there are places in this country who will not address it unless it's done that unless way. Unless it's done that way. Right. Well, you know, the feds have the, have the uh, they did that with our uh, doctor-assisted suicide. We ended up having to run it through twice. Right. And then, uh, well, I forget the fellow's name, who was attorney general, he, uh, he was trying to stop it in federal court, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we're down to about 34 seconds. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks I for think, having me, I Jim. think you brought on a lot of good... You know, even though I'm kind of involved in that as well, uh, because a lot of people I know are involved in it, it still opened my eyes to a few different things. So there's a lot of things we gave people to think about. And that's why they didn't call, probably, because they're busy thinking about all this stuff. So, so, <laughs> so all right, we're down to 10 seconds. I want to thank the crew and uh, thank the caller. And uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in.